You are listening to the REI Mastermind Podcast. Join JD as he chats with industry-leading real estate experts and professionals. We learn from their experience and uncover the strategies to their success that we can implement into our own businesses and we can drive immediate results today. They share their experience and wisdom as we build the foundation to our own success. This is the REI Mastermind Network. We have Curtis May on the call here today. Curtis, really appreciate your time. And and I'm going to just call things out right away because Curtis is the owner of Practical Wealth Advisors. So that's easy to find on, on the interwebs. But uh, also, you got to check out his, his, his podcast. It's called The Practical Wealth Show. Really appreciate your time, Curtis. And uh, we're going to dive into a few topics today. Um, but I really appreciate your time. Hey, I'm excited about it. Uh, and um, let's do it. Let's have some fun. So, you know, I, I always find I'm going to ask this right off the bat, because when it comes to um, wealth advisors, I, I think sometimes uh, wealth advisors, it was kind of a career by accident for most people, if that would be a fair way of, of saying. And you've been in this now for 35 years. Like, how did you start? Uh, it's funny. I started in college. Um, what, you know, upon beginning to realize that the NBA wasn't looking for five eleven shooting guards. <laughs> 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 and here I was at the end of the bench at this division two school. I was like, all right, I need a new dream because this is not going to work out. And, uh, somebody showed me a, a check for $400 and said, this is what I made for hours worth of work. I said, doing what? He showed me what he was doing and, you know, and you got to get a license. And I, I, uh, uh, literally, uh, took off from school to drive, uh, I was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So drive, uh, an hour and a half to Charlotte to, to take my exam. And, uh, a couple of years after that, I got my investment license. This was like mid 85 actually, you know, and I've been pretty much doing it ever, with some pit stops, but pretty much doing it ever since. And just, you know, sure. uh, uh, learn. And I was typical, like I was, Dave Ramsey on steroids. I was evangelical about, you know, buy term investor difference and maxing out your 401ks. And uh, then I read this little purple book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I was like, hmm, what he's talking about and what I'm doing are not the same thing. And so that mm-hmm. started me. Curtis Super Nerd is going down the rabbit hole of because I read the books. Then I read the bibliography of the book, <laughs> you know, that I'm reading right. to see who the author has been reading. And uh, it just, you know. Uh, that's like some Morpheus, just somebody gave me the red pill. I just went down that red hole and I've been going down it ever since. And, uh, but that's, that's how I, so I guess I've, I've always done this. You know, I was blessed because my, my, um, I never got that, what do you call go to school, get a good job talk. I mean, you know, my family, my dad was, we owned a supermarket growing up and we own, you know, uh, bars or taverns here in Philly. So I've never you know, he always told me never making money work for somebody else. So I've heard that since I was seven. So I, I never really, you know, had that go to school, get get the good job. I never got that talk. <laughs> so that's kind of how I ended up here. Sure. Now that's a unique uh, situation, you know, because a lot of, well, when, when I was growing up, uh, my parents, you know, we never owned anything and they were never small business owners, except, you know, my aunts and uncles, they were all farmers. So I guess mm-hmm. that that's entrepreneurial and I saw, I saw that, but um, other than that, you know, usually, usually people are pushed towards the steady eddy, what everybody's experienced in. Yeah. I wasn't pushed that way. He, I, I, I was doing this early on. I said, dad, I think I want to do this, you know? And he says, well, go ahead. I mean, you, and, he, and it sounds like 21 ish. She said, well, yeah, you know, you're never going to make any money or work with somebody else. So go ahead and uh, just make sure you, you, you win, make sure you do it, make sure you make money. And I was my pet and I, you know, I had his backing and I wasn't any good. <laughs> you know, so at, at this, I'm basically introverted and, you know, all that stuff. So this whole journey for me has been one of uh, personal development is, is mm-hmm. kind of allow me to, you know, grow my business and expand, you know, the value that I create in the marketplace. And, and so I'm a big, one of the things that we teach our clients is that you have to work on your mindset, 
your skill set and your network. That is what makes money, you know, and and uh, I am proof positive of that for sure. Sure. You know, um, that's interesting that you say um, that uh, you uh, you're an introvert, but yet you are really in a position or a job that forces you into a lot of one on one situations and and now you're on a podcast. I mean, how hard was that piece of it for you? It's, you know, every time I say that, my kids say, look, you're not an introvert. What are you talking about? I mean, <laughs> you know, because they are, if we're at parties and we get a conversation or a cookout about money, they're a little like dragging me away because I'm now I'm animated. And I'm all hype. But the I love I am. My nature is I'm very comfortable with my solitude. You know, I have this book called stillness is the way or something. No, it's by Ryan. It's I'm, I'm studying, what's it called? Um, stoicism, right? So sure. I have this book by Ryan holiday. Stillness is the key, I think. And I like my solitude and I'm comfortable with my own thoughts and I can literally not be, I'm not uncomfortable being by myself or just reading a book, but I, uh, and if, if we were, let's say, out somewhere. Only time I'm like comfortable approaching people is if I'm at a networking event, we're mm-hmm. able to do those again. And it's like, and even then it's energy. Like, it's like, hi, Curtis. Hi, I'm Curtis May. Damn good to meet you. You know, I got a, it's like a switch I have mm-hmm. to cut on. But right. when I get home, I'm exhausted because it's not my natural state, <laughs> you know, right. but it's, it's now I've, I've learned through, this is the power of personal development, how to win friends, influence people and how to have power and confidence in dealing with all those, I'm going to use a word, cassettes, tapes, right? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, growing up of learning to get good at that because Jim Rohn said, I think I heard from Jim Rohn, it was like your, or no, I think it was Tony Robbins, your income will be in direct proportion to your ability to communicate. So I knew that I had to get better at that. And so I, listen, I, you can be, I think uh, Tom uh, Ziegler's brother said, here's a book called Timid Salespeople Have Skinny Kids. And uh, I, uh, so I said, all right, I'm going to starve to death unless I work on this. So I just, you know, I'm an old basketball player. I call, I always, I'm always working on my game, so to speak. Sure. No, that that's really interesting. Like, uh, you know, I, I find that, uh, you know, I classify myself as an introvert as well. And, and, any and every time I'm in those type of situations, especially networking. Um, and that's one of the reasons I started the podcast is just to, force myself the 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 drive the commitment to networking or the commitment to the show drives yeah. me to talk to people and you know it it, it forces me to be a, a try to force myself into that extrovert at least a little bit yeah that's what it does i mean it is you you have to you know, you, like you've got to let people know. So if you're listeners and if you're you know, in real estate, or you're promoting, you're building syndicate, you I mean, you're in marketing and sales. I don't care what business you're in. Mm-hmm. So you've got to let people know what you're doing. Right. And so people think, oh, I don't, I'm not in sales. I'm not a talker. Sales, that's not sales. Sales is not talking people into stuff. Sales is helping. I got, and I borrowed this from Dan Kennedy, because not, not Dan Kennedy, Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach is, uh, is, I say it right. It's helping people make a future decision that is good for them. Right. So no. And that, so I view that. So working with me is a good decision. So I'm very, you know, confident that I can help people because I know I have a process that works. You know. So, but sure. that's sales. But I'm not talking people into stuff. Most of my work is actually disqualifying people. Sure. Sure. Yeah, we could go all down that whole <laughs> avenue of sales, right? I mean, right. that's interesting you say disqualifying people because more times than not now when people are calling in, you know, I buy a lot of distressed homes and um, I'm usually, the way you ask questions, you're, you're, you're essentially disqualifying them versus trying to convince anybody into anything. I mean, it's just, um, but. You can't, yeah, it's just, you can't really convince and. So I was looking at your notes of like, so if you're like thinking, like if somebody comes to me and they're like very Dave Ramsey-ish, you won't ever get to talk to Curtis because if you are thinking that way, all of my conversation is going to repel you. Mm-hmm. 
this is not, I don't, I'm not trying to convince you of that. You know, if right. um, my philosophy is if you happy broke, I'm happy for you. No, I'm just kidding. That's not, <laughs> that's mean. Let's edit that out. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to keep that in there. In fact, I'll probably use it as a quote. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, because, you know, I always tell, I was, I was, I did a thing on Instagram the other day and I was in a bookstore with these young couple and they were, I was, getting some stuff and it's that's what i like to do to relax i was walking through barnes and noble and they're like hey let's get a book on money and i was like well the money section is over there so i walked back over to see what they were looking at and she had baby steps and he had something they're all over the place i said you know i would start here and i pointed him to rich dad poor dad you know and then i made you know he is well, i read that i says well she should read it his fiance, and then you should read cash flow partners and then i have you rich dad's guide to investing and you know, he's like, well, he's got this book by Buffett. I was like, well, you know, I you like that, but you don't really have a investing as a plan, right? It's not products or tactics. So you he didn't really have a philosophy yet of what they should be doing. And so sometimes people are challenged with risk that because they don't really give you uh it's not tactical, it doesn't tell you what to do, but it's it's you begin to understand how to think because it's not about doing, it's about being. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's be, then do, then have. And most people just want to take a shortcut. And, you know, there's no shortcuts. You've got to learn some stuff. Sure. So and so I I had that with them because they were all over the place. I was like, listen, let me just point you in the right direction here. Listen to my show. I didn't have any cards. I didn't give me information. I said, look, hope you can remember this. Check out the practical wealth show. And I'm hoping they, you know, read some of this stuff and call me later because I'm really curious as how they turned out. <laughs> so. Sure. Well, you know, you you were mentioning some highlights there, um, and since you brought it up, let's talk a little bit about that that financial plan. You know, mm -hmm. were those those bullet points you just gave? Are they part of like an ideal financial plan? Well, part. Let me see. Yeah, a little bit. So, what well, I teach is something called uh, principles based planning. But preceding that, the ideal financial plan should have these bullet points. You want to build maximum wealth. Obviously, mm -hmm. but that's not obvious, right? And uh, you want to be able to enjoy. So I want people to be able to enjoy all the wealth that they created, and not like at sixty-five. I'm talking about now, okay? And mm -hmm. I don't believe in living a deferred life. And um, you want to be able to what I call leave a legacy. So you want to transfer the wealth to your family and charities that are important to you. And then the key thing is that whatever plan that you build, it's got to work under all circumstances. Like you can't have a plan that only works when the sun is shining, you know, when the market's up, when everything mm -hmm. is good, because that's markets go up, markets go down, markets go sideways. And I'm not even talking about the stock market because I'm the anti-Wall Wall Street financial advisor. I'm talking about mark, real estate markets. You know, there's, there's, mm -hmm. uh, so we try to help people identify that there are four asset classes, right? Business, real estate, paper, and commodities. And if you look at the four 400, who's on there? This, they, what do they do? They build businesses <laughs> and they buy real estate. You're right. So that's the, the, you know, the, the game. And then what I teach is something called principles based planning, right? So most people, even with a lot of the real estate investors, like even the really successful ones, what I find is that people skip steps to building like what I call a bulletproof, uh, blueprint or game plan. And so now here, here's what I, I didn't go into this with them, but the, the, the principles are, and I'll just go through them fast and then we can break them down a little bit if you want to, but the, cause there's principles, then there's strategy and then there's tactics. Right. Mm -hmm. And so most people are tactical. You have strategy. Most financial advisors don't have any strategy. They're just selling you products, right? Our tactic is a product that you buy. And then there's principles. So what we start with, and we create a, a, a one-page blueprint called a personal financial snapshot based on our principles. Principle one is saving, right? You got to save 15% of your gross income. See, if you don't save, you don't have any money to invest. The number one problem that I find is lack of capital or lack of access to capital, really capital, uh, on an individual level. And people need to get way more comfortable with having more liquidity than they have. And so we talk about that. The second principle is 
maximum protection. So those are insurances, your, your, your proper liability coverage on your auto. Do you have an umbrella policy? Are you looking at your homeowner's policies, looking at your entities? You know, do you have disability or, you know, do you have, you know, your human life value of your life insurance? And so do you have your estate planning set up? See, a lot of people skip that because that's not sexy. Right. Mm -hmm. And they want to jump right to investing. But you have to play defense. You have to um, uh, secure the kingdom that you're building, because what happens if you get hurt? What happens if you get sick and you can't work? What happens if you die? The whole thing fall apart. So you're just, you know, I have people in real estate versus, oh, you know, I got all this property. My wife will be fine. Or so and so. Yes. But you have no liquidity. Mm -hmm. And you there's stuff that has to do with so you, you can't skip the insurance step. And people think, A, it'll never happen to them. Oh, it'll cost too much. Or they just don't know what maximum protection is. Uh, the, four, the third principle is dealing with legacy, having replacing all of your uh, 100% of your income and the event of your death. Principle four, one of my favorites, is liquidity. See, I want six to 12 months in like cash equivalent accounts. Now, so within that, I'm known for, we teach something called privatized banking or um, uh, infinite banking, if, if some of your listeners may be familiar with it. Mm. So we, that's, but that's a strategy, right? So we go a step back and we teach the principles and then there's a strategy and then there's a tactic that goes with that, you know, properly structured dividend paying whole life. But the principle is where do you store your cash? And, but I want 90 days just for emergencies and anything a month, 90 days is your opportunity fund for you to use that liquidity to buy and build cash flowing assets. And we call that the velocity method. And so we're focused on cash flow, right? So I want you to have liquidity so you can buy even more real estate or buy even more businesses. And really, if somebody is like working with us from an accountability standpoint, I want you to set 90 day targets. What are you doing to grow those numbers? You know, sure. we don't focus on net worth. You can't eat equity. Right. And so it's it's all about cash flow, which is literally the complete opposite of the typical world, which they teach accumulation, what we call mm -hmm. in, our, in our in our system the, the accumulation theory, right? Buy and hold, sure. dollar cost average, max out your 401k, all that stuff is accumulation theory. But all of that is designed to make the financial institutions rich. Doesn't do anything for you. So let me take a breath there because I, you know, I, I can rattle on and uh, yeah. I get excited. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is like really, I mean, it's really well thought out. I mean, and, and frankly, it's a fresh, uh, a fresh air, a breath of fresh air because we, what we typically like, you've brought up a couple of things there that really stand out. But before we dive into a couple of those things, uh, Curtis has an offer for everybody. And, you know, he, he did just mention the velocity uh, to building wealth. Well, you can get, uh, is it a book or an ebook or uh, what is it's it? More of a report. It's, oh, a, it's, it's a, report. a short report. Yeah, it's a report. Mm -hmm. So if you text P wealth, that's P W E A L. TH at 18334220250 um you'll be send a send a link or uh, for that information but i mean that's a great offer so again it's p wealth at 18334220250 and i'll make sure to include that in the show notes for easy access but uh, you'll probably want to make sure you you hit Curtis up on that and and based on what you've been talking about so far, uh, you better check out his his uh, podcast as well, because based on us talking 30 minutes, um, I, I think you can go far more into detail through his website, The, the Practical Wealth Show. Um, but Curtis, you know, you, you mentioned uh, a couple things, like I said, one of them was, is that um, a lot of other financial advisors are they see their clients as customers and it's just to sell them things, you know, just sell them another, another tool or another index or something where you, right. you, you see them as these are tools versus another, another sales event. Right. Right. Products are just 
Like if you buy the way our, our process works is like, listen, if you want to buy a house, you, you need wood, but you don't want wood. You want to buy a house. But if you so if we build the blueprint for you getting the house, you're going to buy a lot of wood. Right. You're going to buy other building materials. So we approach the financial planning that way. We want to give people a, 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 a thought process of, you know, how do you organize? What principles are you going? And then there are financial products that you need, but the products you need should be a result of your knowledge, not a substitute for it. And so most people are just buying stuff that somebody's selling them, but they don't, if you ask them how they work, or if you ask, I ask people, listen, on a scale of one to 10, rate your knowledge about the stock market. And most people, that's like a one. I said, well, they, if, or if we look at their 401k, they're, I said, do you know who manages the fund? Do you know how much fund it, but you'll have it in there 20 years or 10 years and you have no idea how it works. You don't, mm-hmm. you People think that it's a tax. They're saving money in taxes by funding a 401k for the, the, your listeners that still work. And um, But qualified plans, for example, which is one of the top five wealth transfers. See, most people think the key to growing their money is investing. But we teach efficiency. So if you've got a bucket, it's got holes in it, you need to plug the holes first. Right. Mm-hmm. So, Kurt, what is Kurt? I'm the hole plugger guy. Right. And so the, the holes are, are are how you pay your mortgage. Like stop sending extra money. Stop trying to do, you know, do biweeklies or you're not trying to pay your mortgage off early. Let the Fed destroy your debt for you. And um, taxes, as you know, your number one wealth transfer is taxes, how you fund qualified plans. How you pay for like educational expenses, 529 plans and that type of thing, and how you pay for like major capital purchase, which is anything you can't pay for in full with monthly cash flow. So you're going to lose more money in those five things I just mentioned than you'll ever make trying to pick winning investments. Mm-hmm. Right. So you gotta you gotta stop, you gotta keep it and and become more efficient. Now when you grow. You don't have any leaks, right? And so now you're going to grow because you don't have any holes at the bottom of your bucket. And so while they're listening to your show and they're learning how to do real estate, well, you've got to understand how money works so that you can make your money work harder for you, you know, so mm-hmm. that you're more efficient, so that you're more tax efficient. You know, let's, I'll, I'll finish the qualified plan thought is that they only do two things. They defer taxes. And so the question, and they defer the tax calculation. That's what they do. So if you you got to ask yourself, well, do I think in the future taxes will be higher, lower, or the same? Right. And most people, ever I ask that, so they say higher. Well, why would you defer them then? Mm-hmm. You know. So it's like you just have to think through some of the sacred cows that are out there and really think about, are they, because when a financial institution builds a product here, what we talk about is the four rules of a financial institution. So think about this. They, what are they, if you were starting a bank, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you need money to put in. So if you're coming to me, you want me to deposit my money in your bank. Right. Don't you? Right. How often? As often as possible. As often as possible. And how uh, long do you want me to keep it there? As long as possible. And how soon would you want me to take it out? Never. Never. (laughs) So think about that, right? So every financial product that that is manufactured is built with those rules in mind. Mm -hmm. And unless you rethink you still need to use them but you need to use them how they use them mm-hmm. and not how they teach you to use them you got to tell you got to do what the banks or the institutions do not what they tell you to do right yeah you know when you think about it i, I almost think that a lot of um i'm going to call it training or money management the what we've been taught is almost the ron popeel of of banking and savings. You're, you're supposed to just set up an account, shovel money into it, set it and forget it. Right. Yeah. You're not, we're, we're not meant to uh, question things. And, and frankly, in most cases, 
like in a 401k or an IRA, you know, these, these accounts, you have no idea what companies you're investing in. Nope. And how, and, and how does not paying attention and not understanding what you're doing is, is going to work out long range <laughs> for, yeah. you know, and, and think about this. So what would, would, uh, a corporation or a bank or institution ever lock their money away for 30 or 40 years? No, they're, they're constantly lending it out. They're constantly. And so they're creating, so while they're teaching you to buy and hold and worry about the magic of compound interest, the rule of 72 and portfolio rebalancing, they are creating velocity of money, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the economic principle in real estate, the Burr method, or, you know, I have a client that buys uh, notes and, uh, and so what do you want? You want velocity. You want to, how soon can you get your money back so you can deploy it into another asset? That right. is what is an asset, something that throws off cash flow, right? So you're you have to focus on cash flow. That's what they focus on. And so they there's velocity, cash flow is leverage. So if a, if a corporation had a million dollars in cash and a million dollars in debt, you look to them, that is a balance sheet neutral decision. Mm-hmm. They would not pay the debt off. That wouldn't even enter their minds. Look, I got a million dollars cash. Can I make my money make more money than the debt cost me? Mm-hmm. And so if you're listeners, you have to learn to think like that. So you've got to get, I got a client, she has like four or five properties. She's still trying to pay the damn mortgage off. I'm like, what are you doing? Okay. You have to let that Susie Orman stuff go. All right. Let it go. All right. Because you can't grow because rich people use debt as money. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, and so you want to get into my client, which I interviewed her on my show. She's got like $10 million worth of real estate. And she's got six million dollars of debt. And she's like, she's bought houses with credit cards, and she's, you know, and but she's got probably uh three hundred grand or so of cash flow, you know, over you know uh where she's living off of, but and she's using other people's money to do it, and there's zeros out her taxes. I love that, but I don't, she don't have car loans, she stores all her money in the banking systems that we create for long-term money, and then she leverages that to go buy more stuff. So she, her whole life is velocity. Velocity, and so that's what you've got to learn to, it goes back, you know, one of the things that we teach people is investing is not about buying something. It's about becoming something, right? You got to invest in your expertise. You got to invest in what you understand. You got to invest in uh, your knowledge. And then, so our three rules of investing are is invest in yourself, invest in what you can control, what you can, you know, uh, influence the outcome of what's generating cash flow. And then the third rule is don't, don't chase returns. But most people are out there chasing returns. They're mm-hmm. speculating, they're not even investing. Yeah. You know, well, we're seeing especially a lot of that right now, whether it's through on, on all this online, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or Wall Street bets or the GameStop thing, it's all speculation. It's all speculation. There, yeah. And so you got to ask yourself is, so I'm not saying you shouldn't speculate, but I would ask your listeners to say, well, what do I want? So if you want to be financially free, see, because when you hear the Wall Street, oh, we've got X amount assets under management. Well, we just talked about the four rules. So if you got a million dollars or $2 million in a 401k, how excited are they about you turning that money into cash flow? Mm -hmm. Because they're charging you fees. So if you take money out, you literally are costing them money. So you're never going to get, oh, I think I want to take some money out of this account so I can buy some real estate. They're, oh, no, no, we can put you in a REIT. You know, that's that's their idea of real estate, but you don't own that. That's just a mutual fund backed by real estate, but it's still uh, uh, a stock right. or what I call a paper asset. So that's not a real thing. So you have to. I'm a big fan of Beverly Hills Cop. You can't fall for the banana in the tailpipe, right? You got you have to um, go watch Beverly Hills Cop with Eddie Murphy from 1984. You'll get the reference to that joke. <laughs> and uh, the um, but they're kind of faking you out, and you have to you know you want to focus on cash flow. So your objective, and this is what we talk about, is passive income greater than or equal to your expenses, preferably greater than. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so you can get out the rat race. So now if you're focused on that, you're not running around chasing shiny objects. You're not running around hoping Bitcoin goes up. Maybe you do some of that, but how do you? How does that turn into passive income greater than your expenses? I mean, you still have to shell the shares, or if you're investing for capital gains, the only way to turn that money into capital is to sell the shares. So now you no longer have the investment. Mm -hmm. That's why real estate is so powerful, right? You can you can get a hundred or you know say you know I always tell people look if you want a hundred thousand dollars worth of stock. You need a hundred thousand dollars, right? But if you want a hundred thousand dollars worth of real estate or a million dollars worth of real estate, how much do you need? And the true answer is what? It depends. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say worst case, 20%. So now you're controlling a hundred thousand dollar asset with 20% of it and using 80% of other people's money. But you know, as your knowledge goes up, now you can raise capital, you got creative financing and or use other people's money, but that goes back to you got to learn how to do that. So it goes back to skill set. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and when you know how to make the magic happen and do syndications, then then people who don't know anything will start throwing money at you to do deals. So if you read like the, uh, I, was, I was talking to a client, he was reading the uh, Think and Grow Rich and, you know, Think and Grow Rich. There's nothing in that book about investing. Mm -hmm. If you think about that, it's all about you know, organized, plan, specialized knowledge. So if you have specialized knowledge, that's what creates money. Mm -hmm. So anyway, stop me because, you know, I can. No, no, I can. <laughs> this is great. I, you know, I, and it makes, it, it just, it's just a great reminder on a lot of levels. And I mean, um, fr frankly, if you're listening to my show and you haven't read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I mean, after this show, go buy a copy like immediately. I mean, it, I mean that lays the ground foot groundwork for what Curtis is talking about here. But um matter of fact, that's required reading. Uh like in my pre-talks with people, I'm seeing if they're, you know, that if they're a good fit to work with us. I I they have to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Richest Man in Babylon. That's those are like my uh, prerequisites two, of two great just, books. Yeah. yeah, that's and so now you're because when you talk about principles, you know, really all I teach is that chapter two is the seven cures for a lean purse is, is the, you know, the second uh, the chapter in the book. And those are principles. See principles are unchanging and that's why you have to build your plan. So I'm very, we haven't been very tactical on this call other than the five principles, but I'm very tactical, but I basically take the rich dad stuff and put it into a tactical game plan and you know, making sure you're saving, making sure you're protected, making sure you're liquid. And it's not my job to tell you what to invest in. It's your job. OK, my mm -hmm. job is to make sure all that, uh, the best I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure you understand how the difference between asset and liability. You know how to read the mm -hmm. numbers. And then, you know, success is when opportunity meets the preparation. So if you've got money, you've built up your capital and you have knowledge and now you are your what is the money there for? is to look for stuff. You should see yourselves as like little baby Berkshire Hathaways, you know, with like Buffett. All he does is his Berkshire Hathaway just buys, he don't buy stock, he buys the businesses. So you're all buying assets, like right? Or a little hedge fund. I heard Dave Abraham say this the other day. And a little hedge fund or big hedge fund, depending on what you're doing, but you're, you know, making money. So you're growing your businesses, you're saving that cash flow, and then you're looking for assets to buy or build and that's your life that's what you do mm -hmm. and that's your focus because that which gives one you get what you focus on you know you don't end up walking around and end up on top of mount everest i mean you have the plan to climb mount everest right you know like, how, right. how to get up here you know no you don't do that you know so you're not going to reach the summit of financial freedom just maxing out your 401k and just you know hoping to work hard and you know, fund your 401k, it's, it's just, it's not going to happen. So I, 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 if nothing else, and I think if you're listening to your show, they should know that. And if you don't have Rich Dad Poor Dad, I want you to go to the bookstore, get it off the shelf and beat yourself in the head with it for taking so long. <laughs> <laughs> no, so. I, well, yeah, I'm sure people. Or are take your, take your Dave Ramsey book and beat yourself in the head with it. <laughs> for it. <laughs> So, no, you know, and Dave Ramsey, silly, guys, he, he does you. have some strategies and tactics that do work. But when it comes to savings, that's where uh, we probably 
Well, you know, the thing is, so this is what I told them. I said, listen, there's, you have to decide what you want. This is what I told a couple of the books. All right. I said, you have to decide what you want to be when you grow up. Right. And so you want to be rich. You want to be poor. You want to be middle class. And so Dave is, if you're, or Susie, if you're uh, um, like a spendthrift and you're in debt and you're a mess, you can't manage cash flow. His stuff is awesome. And it gets you what I call on top of the horse. Mm-hmm. But now if you want to go and, and go into uh, uh, financial freedom land or, or rich dad call the fast track. Now you're into rich dad. You're into you know, Laurel Langmire, like her to the millionaire maker and those type of things. And now you're you're picking your asset class. So I like business. Do I like real estate? Do I like this? And then you're picking the vehicle or vehicles that will take you to glory. But pick a horse and ride it. Mm-hmm. And you're good at that. And then that can get another horse, you know, and now you have a stable okay, of, right. of bringing you money back. But that, but you, you know, some people are like, I got a client, she's all over the place. So it's like, pick one for six months, you know, a year, and then add another income stream on top of that one. Cause you're just, you most people are running around like a dog chasing her tail, chasing shiny objects. And then, Oh, I'm going to buy Bitcoin. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm doing a little bit of this. And is all I ask them is like, is that, going to help you uh, develop passive income greater than your expenses in 10 years or less. Mm-hmm. That's our goal. And if it doesn't, then drop it and focus on, stay focused on that. Sure. Sure. So that's a, no, I and, you know, and, and that's, that's <laughs> another thing there that you just pointed out then you, you're trying to accomplish this in 10 years or less. Um. That is a much shorter time frame than I've heard from other financials advisors. And and what I really liked early on in our conversation, you said we're trying to avoid that deferred retirement in a way. You know, you're trying to subsidize your income now so you can take advantage of this now. Yes, I don't believe in retirement. Retirement is an agricultural term that means to withdraw or to put out of use. And that's that. Retirement is a man-made concept. You know, it's made up by uh, uh, FDR who borrowed it from Otto von Bismarck and uh, which was a socialist idea to get, make, move out the old workers to make room for the new workers. And, you know, socialism has never worked in the history of mankind, right? So you can't, you know, you, it's, it's, it's flawed. You know, you're, you're just, a man is a goal seeking device. So you, you want to, I, I always tell people, look, I want you to be able to do what you want to do instead of what you have to. Okay. And there's only so much golf you can play or whatever. You know, I would, if, if you dropped a billion dollars on me right now, I would still do this. Okay. I would teach financial literacy classes and I'd probably be a high school basketball coach. Sure. But I would not stop working, you know, or, mm-hmm. or, or, Hey, I'm rich and I'm going to go to try to run. Around. I would do some of that, but I would still, you, you got to, you know, now you can find your purpose. So let's say you're making money, but it, it, it doesn't fulfill you. Well, if you work, you got to buy your life back. And then, you know, I had a woman, she wanted to do mission work where people want to, you know, I had a client, she wanted, she wanted to do something called Long War Gardens here. She really liked like horticulture and she, her goal was to do that. Either volunteer or working part time in that. And she loved that. But you've got to build up the assets you know, we talk about, I use a Jim Rome definition. Financial independence is being able to live like you want to live from the income from your personally invested assets. So it's asset-based income. You got to buy assets that throw off a check every month. And mm-hmm. so if you can do that, you're effectively retired. You know I mean? You don't have to work if you don't want to. And so what we try to do is help, we have a, we develop a process and put the pieces together to help our clients aspire to work optional income. Like, so mm-hmm. you don't uh, have to work uh, if you don't want to, like, even if you shut your business down, if you're in business, you're still supposed to be, and not on just one liquidation event, you should have be extracting money out of your business, saving 15, 20% of your income and buying other assets. So if you shut the, the business down, you're still supposed to be financially independent. Mm-hmm. And so, but you have, that's, you have to think about that. You've got to have a plan that does. You have to have somebody that supports you 
in that thinking. And I don't think typical advice, you know, if if their objective is assets under management, it could be great people, but that's just how the industry works. And that's what they're told to do. So, you know, that Wall Street is a, is a product manufacturer and most reps are uh, what I call manufacturer's reps. They just sell the financial products in the idea. I had a client, this is when I lost my religion <laughs> and uh, on Wall Street. I was uh, doing the teachers, this is like 20 years ago. And I was doing the retirement plans in the school district They're called Full 3 bs of Chester, PA. And this woman, this is right after 9-11, a woman, uh, she lost, like, I inherited her. So I didn't put her in this stuff, but she was in all these unsuitable things. She's 68 and she lost like 50 grand in, I want to say a month and a half, two months. And so uh, we have a meeting so that, you know, the, the wholesalers from this, if I named the company, you would know, came down from Mount Olympus to bless the register reps. And I told him this story. He says, well, you know, the market's going to come back. And I was, I was incensed. I was like, are you insane? Did I mention that she was 68? The market's not going to come back in her lifetime. And I was done right there. Hmm. Like, how dare you tell me that nonsense? And, uh, you know, and I had already been reading Rich Dad Poor Dad. It was, and I was like, all right, I'm already feeling some kind of way. And I've, I've lived through three crashes and I didn't know why. And, you know, that I started studying Austrian economics and the business cycle theory because I needed to know what was happening. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Nelson Nash told me one time, he said, listen, if you know, son, if you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. Right. And most people, that's why we talk before we start recording. You can't just have in a world where you are all you see is real estate. Right. Because you need to think one of the things we talk about is you got to think from a macro perspective because everything affects everything else. So you need to see what how to a, protect yourself and b how to take advantage of opportunities. And you want to be able to see them coming from a long way away. And so if you start understanding economics and starting thinking from, you know, how these other asset classes um so people say, oh, you know, we're printing all this money and there's no inflation. I said, well, you see, go to, to, to Lowe's and try to buy some wood. You're starting to see the inflation in commodity mm -hmm. prices, in oil prices. Well, what's that going to do to building prices, which is going to, you know, and see. So all of that stuff, you've got to kind of see that. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of stuff I try to get our clients to think about. I just don't want you to be waiting there and hoping the daggone market goes up. So that's a lot. Not, not all at once. You, know, you eat a piece of one slice at a time. But, you know, we do monthly and weekly educational calls for our clients. So I'm always, you know, trying to, you know, help them block out the, the noise they hear uh, right. and, and just give them new information. So, you know, as y'all hear, I can talk. Mm -hmm. And so we, <laughs> we uh, I've got a lot to say on this topic because I'm very passionate about it. Because if you don't hear it from me, you're not going to hear it. Right. No, I, I, this is, this is how I'm going to end this. Uh, you know, I, I have to, I have to point out that, you know, I, I'm one of those big proponents and, and my listeners have heard this time and time again, that you are the sum of those five people you hang out with. And if you don't have somebody like Curtis as one of those five, um, you're missing out. I mean, if, if, if one of those fives is simply subscribing to Curtis's podcast, and so you have him in your ear, at least, I don't know how often you release Curtis once a week, weekly, once a week, weekly. I mean, that alone will, will be consider that one of your five, if you have to, but you have to have that constant interject injection of what Curtis is talking about. So again, head over to find the practical wealth show on, on your favorite podcast app, um, practical wealth And again, if you text P wealth at one eight three three four two two zero two five zero. Uh, you'll get a report re around the create wealth through velocity of money. Um, this has been a great conversation. And, but I always end with, is there a question you wished I would have asked here today? Hmm. I don't think so. I, um, um, no, you're right. I, Cause I'm going blank. I mean, you know, I, I just, uh, people say, what'd you say? I said, no, you were, you writing it down? <laughs> Cause like, you couldn't <laughs> tell me what I said 20 minutes ago. So no, I thought, I thought it was a great, I had a lot of fun. I, I love, you know, sharing this stuff. Cause I just, I think that, 
you know, we are, and, and Curtis has no original thoughts, just so you know. I mean, so I just, I follow the winners, you know, I try to follow successful people and I try to distill, you know, successfully include. So if you start to, to listen and you hear the language of, of, of what the winners are doing, um, you know, winners win. So you listen to, to Buff. A great book is, uh, that I like is called The Joy of Compounding. Mm-hmm. And I forget the author, but he's studying Charlie Munger and um, Warren Buffett. And what happens is they read so much. And I, when I read it, I was like, oh, I get this. You know, it's if you start to, if you expand your knowledge, then what happens is you'll, the dots start to connect, mm-hmm. you know, at, from the creativity, you'll say, oh, this was over here. And it seems like it has nothing to do with each other, but then you'll look over here and you start to see how they call it a lattice work of connections. And so is you. You know, if you want to get good at something, guys, you got to practice, you got to study and you got to teach. So we teach our clients, you know, play cash flow, you know, do a book study with rich dad, poor dad and go through the study questions. Well, I told that couple and um, that I was talking to or, you know, do a book study on, you know, what are the five laws of gold for richest man in Babylon and teach it. And what you'll do is you'll find your understanding gets better as you show it to somebody else. And so we, we've got to you know, to, to borrow the, the COVID world, we're all in this together, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't want you to, to, to look for uh, um, the main thing I teach people. So listen, stop looking for other people to solve your problems and, uh, uh, and take control of your life and stop looking for other people to save you, save yourself. You know, you, you bring up the cash flow game and you probably know the trick to that game. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to ruin it for everybody. But, you know, we were talking about networking and being around like-minded people. Cash flow has a second lesson there that I, I think sometimes gets missed. And I, I like to bring it up on occasion because uh, I think it's, it's interesting because I think it, it directly correlates to real life. You know, most people go into, into games and it's all about competing or beating the people around you mm-hmm. when, you're, when you're at the game. But Cash flow is designed so that if you start playing it as a cooperative game, the game is over in like 30 minutes and everybody wins because everybody leaves the table wealthy hmm. in the end. So if you I, start to I help each other out that way, yeah, I know it teaches you to collaborate because school teaches you to get an A and not to collaborate, but you really should be getting the cards and asking, what about this? You know, is this cash or cash return? Is this good? Mm-hmm. And people are trained not to do that. Yeah. So when you said earlier, your income is a direct measure of how you communicate, you know, that's an, that's a great example of that. Like if you, if you communicate and collaborate with those people around that table, around that board, um, you'd be surprised at the results. Yeah. And then, and the game imprints on you and you will, you're, you'll slowly, you'll start seeing the world differently. You'll start mm-hmm. seeing financial statements and everything. And um, because Rich Dad Poor Dad is basically a book about accounting. I've heard Rich Dad Poor Dad. I always tell people, if y'all see the Matrix, the, make the first Matrix. And at the end where Neo starts to believe and he could see the Matrix and everything mm-hmm. is in slow motion. When I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I was like, I get it. I see it. I'm the one, you know, because I... <laughs> I <laughs> Like, so for example, I was just talking to Clyde. We were joking because he had the Carlton Sheet stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but those of y'all, you know, and I had the cassettes, I said I had the cassettes and the CDs, but he would do a performer, right? And he would talk about in the thing of performing. I didn't know what that was. I didn't, I didn't understand it. And when I reached that point, I was like, oh, that's what he's talking about. You know, it's just mm-hmm. a financial statement. This is like, and so all of a sudden, all these, I started to see them in everything. You know, so mm-hmm. when I work with clients, if you talk to me for like Within five questions, I could draw you the, you know, the little boxes from Rich Dad Poor Dad. I could draw them on a yellow pad and, and show you the story of your life in five, six questions. This is number story. This, this is this has <laughs> been a this has been a greatest a great conversation. And if you haven't figured it out, Curtis is the one. So I am the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Curtis. I hope we could chat again. Please, I would love to. I would love to. I'll tell you both things I know. This has been the REI Mastermind Network. You can already tell that we've made some changes and a few more are on the way. If you are interested in what we have planned, 
head over to patreon.com slash REI Mastermind and support the show today. Financial contributions are always appreciated, along with a like, share, and review. It really helps us grow and reach more people with this valuable information. See you next time, and tell a friend.